Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, my name is Paul Branch, and I am the Chief Operating Officer here at the IACCM. And it is my pleasure to, to welcome two colleagues uh, to talk to you today about contract management best practices in the new normal. You know, we've all seen uh, and experienced indeed the, the pandemic um, and the impact that it's had on our day-to-day -day lives, both uh, professional and personal. And so today, um, it's, it's going to be a really interesting uh, set of uh, discussions, I hope. Um, we've got two speakers, um, Brian, uh, who's Senior Director of Procurement Operations at Kindred at Home. Now, Brian's a practitioner in contract and commercial management, and we're going to hear from him um, from the horse's mouth, so to speak, as to, as to his experiences of deploying contract lifecycle management automation. Uh, our second speaker, uh, John, John from Scout RFP. Um, John is, uh, is going to share with us a little bit more about the capabilities of the Scout RFP product. And you'll see how it segues and, and supported the set of business requirements uh, that Brian, Brian shared with us. So in our agenda for today, um, after some, uh, some of our, our, our brief introductions, um, I will um, share with you some of our research findings. Um, IACCM, as you know, is engaged in a lot of research, particularly at the moment, um, but is, um, is uh, keen I'm keen to share those those with you. Um, uh, once we've uh, once we've gone through the the research, um, I'll hand off to our colleagues and and for the for the meat of it, Brian's going to share his experiences of um, of of working um, in in uh, deploying a CLM automation capability, and John's then going to going to share some of his experiences of working with multiple clients. Um, in deployment of this technology. So as Mark said at the beginning, um, please do ask questions as we go. Um, there's some um, particularly knowledgeable speakers today, so let's take advantage of their, of their experience and, uh, and they'll be happy to share uh, with our members today. So before we get into the meat though, um, let's look at our key findings and changes since the last time we reported on the on the impact of the pandemic. Um, our research, not surprisingly, I guess, really reflects what's happening in the wider e economy. Um, we're seeing a much more significant assessment of the impact. So up from 19% to 79% and, and, and increasing indeed, are reporting a moderate to severe impact of the, of the coronavirus epidemic. And the, the, the flow is moving across the globe. So while some jurisdictions are now starting to come out of lockdown, um, others are, are um, uh, regrettably um, uh, uh, much earlier on in the wave. So we're now seeing that Africa and the Middle East uh, are being much more severely impacted than they were previously. Um, so what we're going to look at today is how um, how the the impacts of the of the of the pandemic are driving different thinking in the CLM and automation space. One thing one thing I'd like to share with you before we move off this slide um, is on the bottom row there. Eighty four percent of professionals believe that they have the technology in place that they need to work from home. However, what we also know is that. Um, uh, a number, a large number of those, in fact, um, north of 80%, are also looking to make investments in the technology, um, either at, either uh, to refresh what they already have, to augment what they already have, or indeed to completely replace it. So now is the time, and I'm sure the the interest in this call is driven by the fact that that there are material benefits, as we're about to hear, material benefits from um, engaging in this technology, and and now is the time to to start to uh, to optimise to start to deliver on some of those those business benefits. So, enough from me. Uh, without further ado, let me hand off to my colleague Brian um, from Kindred at Home. Uh, Brian, over to you. Fantastic. Uh, I just want to make sure you can hear me okay. Yes, we can hear you fine. Thank you. 
Fantastic. Good. So this is Brian Garcia, the Senior Director of Procurement Operations for Kindred at Home. I uh, want to start off by giving everyone a little bit of a viewpoint in terms of our, our history and how we developed, because I think it's it's critical to, to our story. So Kindred at Home is a relatively new company. Um, about a year and a half ago, we split off from a parent organization. Uh, and in doing so, we actually ended up with, you know, all of our resources, we have over 700 locations that provide in-home services, in-home uh, health services and in-home hospice services. Um, but we really did not get the, the, the functions, um, the resources that go with the functions and the, a lot of the systems that go with those particular functions, such as like finance and procurement and all of that. So we ended up having to build those from scratch. Um, so in, in building those from scratch meant that we started by developing our procurement organization and looking for our tools as we went through this separation from our parent organization and set up and uh, rationalizing our headquarters and our core functions to support uh, what is really kind of three services we provide in the field. So our home health services, our community services and our hospice services. And I, I wanna bring that, that kind of piece of the story in because part of our separation meant that we also were separating contracts um, and, and contracts became a, a is a critical piece of our development as our own standalone organization uh, because we had to go through the typical phases of identifying all the vendors that we would need uh, to stand alone contracting with all of those vendors in a really compressed time frame uh, and then also being able to operationalize those contracts and manage those contracts long term and so as we developed our procurement team and we were doing all of that work, all of this was happening in parallel. Uh, and so as you can imagine, there's you know, teams of people involved from different areas of specialty that are working on contracts, coordinating with procurement, coordinating with legal, there's a lot of paper being signed. Uh, there's also very critical decisions around duration of contracts. And many of our contracts uh, are on the shorter term duration, just as we were setting things up, we wanted to make sure we had the flexibility to continue to be nimble and change as we went through our first couple of years as an organization. So a lot of our contracts were, were shorter term. Um, and some of them, you know, very strategic suppliers that we identified initially, you know, those were given terms that were a little bit longer and had a little bit different kind of language to them. So um, I think that's important background. That's kind of what we were dealing with as we separated this, the stand up of our own organization, just you know, terribly exciting, also very stressful and also a, just a, a mountain of, of work to, to set up a new organization. So that's where we started. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I can show, give everyone insight into what we did from a procurement operations standpoint. So you know, this little graphic kind of just very simply lays out what we put into the scope for our procurement operations services. And with that, um, we have a strategic component, our category management. We also have all of our operational services and our operational services are twofold. There's a kind of a transactional piece and then there's also a strategic piece. Um, and a lot of this stuff, you know, we could do, um, but not everything we have the tools for. And one of those main areas where we were actually missing the tools was the contract management. Um, we basically were keeping track in a, a, another tool that didn't really have the functionality we needed. It didn't have workflow. It, it didn't have all the abstract data that we needed to properly manage our contracts. And, and also just created a, a huge situation where we had limited visibility. Um, and so as we sort of stood up the organization and we defined these roles and scopes, you know, we had, we could not stop the previous work. So as many people out there, you're, you're, you're fixing the car as the car is moving, that sort of old analogy. And, and I could definitely see there was this wave of contracts being executed and they were sort of just being stuck into a repository that wasn't, didn't necessarily have the intelligence that we wanted. And, and so we started down this path of what's, what are our needs in terms of contract management? What do we hope to get out of our contract management tools? We set this up. Um, and then how are we going to not only operationalize it, but then also pull in all of these contracts that we're getting signed 
and develop a path for managing that. So I was really, you know, it's a, it's a green field for me, which was fantastic. Um, and so we, we definitely went down through that path of, of software selection. And if you want to go ahead and go to the next slide. Just, just before we move off there, Brian, a question, yes. question's come in uh, at the front end of your process. How did you justify the business case for investment in your automation tools? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, I would say there, there's the way that we did it, and then there's the the way that I would suggest that it's done. Um, and I, in my prior life, before working at Kindred at Home, I was actually on the consulting side, um, and we saw this quite a bit. The easiest way to justify it is to not only say that you're going to do a strategic sourcing initiative, but also provide the tools in place for long-term ensuring the results can be maintained or over time. And so wrapping together a strategic so, strategic sourcing initiative with large savings with the tools to manage those savings is what I would say would be the preferred method. Um, we actually do the timing and the pace that we were going at. We did not do that. We actually had done most of our sourcing up front and then we're left with, okay, well, how do we, how do we manage and justify the long-term piece? So, the, when we got into that discussion, one of the reasons that we chose Scout was because we were trying to do a number of different things across our procurement operation services. So our tracking of all of our savings, our projects that we use to, on the strategic side, along with some of our vendor interaction and our contracts, that functionality for us, you know, we have all that functionality in Scout. So the tool actually provides greater coverage than just the contract management piece we're talking about today. Because we were able to tie it to the savings tracking and the savings projects, that provided a lot of wind behind our, our argument. Also on the risk component, there was, you know, our team is a very, very lean team. So if you look at, you know, our headcount for the size of organization that we actually are, we have three people that are focused on more of our strategic stuff. I've got a team uh, of five people that handles all of the operational component. And so when you start to divide that out, there's just no way to manage contracts efficiently without having a tool to do it. So it became a, this is an essential piece of technology. If we're going to keep the team the size that it is and be able to manage the contract volume that we have. So a compelling argument, really. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, so hi, uh, this is John. Um, so as Brian was saying, I think all the challenges that he saw, we also saw from uh, a lot of our other customers, right? And so as he was saying, that, you know, Scout is not obviously a, just a contract tool. Um, in fact, we started off as being a pure procurement specific tool focused on RFPs. And um, as we talked to um, our users just about their challenges, um, a lot of the sort of tangential effects of kind of contracting and that contracting process came up. So words like black hole or frustration or leaky, um, these are things that we heard quite often. Um, so as we dug deeper, um, we came up with this contract module that's specifically there to help uh, make the process of creating and tracking contracts easier. So, I mean, that's, that's actually the, the value that Scout brings to a lot of folks. And it's, it's Great to hear that Brian has uh, has kind of the same understanding of it, uh, and really that's that's the kind of value that software should bring to, to any of our users. Um, speaking of value, I think we have our first poll question. Yeah, so let's let's run to the poll if we could. So um, the the question is, um, how much value does your contract management technology provide? when responding to pandemic issues. So it's a question of basically in the in the here and now. So um, high, moderate, or, or very little value. Um, none because you're currently looking into the contract management technology and an automation strategy, uh, but haven't got anything yet. Or none simply because you have no plans to invest in that, in that space. So, um, Give that a couple more more seconds for us to, uh, to 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 make our votes. And now, Mark, if you could close the poll, let's let's take a look at the results. All 
Right. So that's very interesting. So that's a pretty even spread, all things considered. I guess yeah. a little bit more um, in the moderate value. Um, uh, Twenty percent ish in the high value, um, and then pretty much spread across the rest. Uh, interesting, John. What what do you think about that? Well, <laughs> certainly it's interesting that there there's a decent amount of folks that have no plans to invest, uh, the same as, as as the high value side. But but mm. yeah, most folks seems to be in the middle, right? Sort of. Um, and, and honestly, I think you know the experience from Brian probably will 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 uh, help a lot of these folks as well. How do you get more value out of these things? And if you're looking to uh, implement contract management technology, what are the things you should consider? So this is, this is actually pretty good. And it's really interesting, actually, that, that some of our most recent research um, uh, looked at the, 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 the likelihood that folks would report um, the criticality of a CLM tool to their business processes. And it was really interesting to see that those folks who had invested thought uh, in a much, much higher proportion, thought that the CLM automation technology was fundamental to their business survival. Whereas those that had not invested in the technology were nowhere near as sure about the criticality of the of the of the automation. So interesting. Um, and it creates, I think, an opportunity, you know, because for the folks, 15, 17 percent who uh, who haven't who have no plans to invest, on, on top of the 20% who are who are looking, um, creates a big opportunity for those to, to make to, to drive systemic improvements into into their operations. So hey, interesting. Paul, interesting. Yes. To, to jump in here on this one, so and, and only because our has made this change so rapidly from not having a tool to having a tool. When when previous to Scout we didn't have visibility to what was about to expire. We didn't have reporting on what was about to expire. We were in a very reactionary mode. So vendors would call in and they would, they would send us renewal forms or they would send us notices that you know, contracts had renewed and you know, the escalation had been, had been utilized. And we, didn't have, we were basically reacting to news and we were too late to really have the value that we wanted to have. But that was an internal procurement frustration. You know, the, the business didn't feel that um, as much or didn't understand kind of the impact of that. So we were always very reactionary, which was from a procurement professional's perspective, extremely frustrating. Now that we have a tool and we have reporting, we're able to kind of get ahead of that curve. Whereas, you know, I, I would view us, if I were to answer the poll myself, as, you know, having high value here because I'm being proactive. I'm ahead of the curve. I'm ahead of renewals and notices. And I actually can do what a procurement person just naturally wants to do, which is be able to influence and impact before these things are re-signed or renewed or re-upped. Um, so we, I've gone from our organization being at the very bottom, no plans to invest, convincing them it was valuable to, you know, I would now answer at the top high value. Interesting. It doesn't, yeah, you can, you can move from one end of the spectrum to the other quite fast. Very good. Okay, okay, Brian, let's, uh, let's move on. Thank you. Yeah, so these, you know, I, I kept these goals in here for the presentation um, in, in terms of what we wanted to do with the tool for kind of twofold. These are goals that we wrote prior to the pandemic. And, and these are things that we knew we needed to, as an organization, invest in these and drive these to increase our, our procurement maturity, especially within the contracting space. You know, our information availability, I talked just a second ago, we went from having not the ability, you know, we had no visibility effectively to now I've got fantastic visibility at my fingertips that multiple people can run and have access to. So we've we've really kind of succeeded in, in that goal with the implementation of our contract tool with Scout. Um, the ability to create a pipeline. But what that means for us is I wanted to know what people needed to work on and I wanted to know where it was in the cycle. And having that then allowed from a central standpoint to either farm some of this stuff out so I could actually give it to someone who's in a functional role and have them work on a contract renewal or a new contract, or I can have someone on my team in workflow 
having the ability to know where they are in the process of maybe abstracting that or following up on these contracts. And so that was a big piece of it too. The, the prioritization of limited resources I mentioned earlier, you know, we've got a relatively small team. I only have a handful of people in my procurement operations group. Um, and when you look at the number of locations we support, that I think drives or can drive a lot of activity. 700 locations is a tremendous number of locations in terms of a you know, decentralized workforce to support. So having understanding of what's going on and what they need, our folks are relatively strapped and, and we, we purposely run a very tight team, very lean team. So having the ability to prioritize you know, what's coming due or what's of most importance and to manage those resources through the tool as opposed to trying to manage it without a tool, you know, that prioritization piece was extremely important to us. I think as you get down to some of our other objectives in terms of managing risk, everyone says they want to manage risk. And it doesn't necessarily get a lot of leadership time in some organizations until you have something like a pandemic, in which case risk all of a sudden is at the very top. You know, which one of these vendors are our approved vendors that we have contracts with? Which of these vendors are vendors that maybe fall in a different area of your uh, vendor profiling that are kind of secondary or at least approved? And which ones are you moving out saying, you know what, these guys are not people we're going to use again. So the risk piece through the pandemic, I think, soared to the very top of this list um, versus like the negotiation results through the pandemic. And bear in mind, I'm in a healthcare organization. We're buying PPE for frontline workers. The negotiation results were what was more important was the availability of product, not necessarily the cost of product. So our, our negotiations definitely shifted what was priority there. Um, but on managing risk in terms of making sure we had product availability, making sure we're working with the right people, that we had the right contracts and we could trace it back, you know, became all of a sudden paramount. And then also just a long-term kind of boosting our efficiency and leverage. You know, that was a goal at the beginning of the year. I did not realize though how critical that was going to be during the pandemic. So when we started this process, we had a lot of our procurement leadership involved in contract management. You know, our category directors, and we've got two of them, plus a VP, they manage the contracts. Um, they had to keep track of, you know, what were the expiration dates, what was going on with them, what was the status. And that took a lot of leadership bandwidth. When we put Scout in place, it all of a sudden gave us the ability to work within a really well-structured tool that a lot of the stuff that the leadership previously was doing on their own laptops and Excel files, now all of a sudden could be automated, could be refreshed on a weekly basis or a daily basis and could also be pushed down within our own procurement team so that some of my you know, lower level uh, employees could you know, handle these tasks because there was a structure in place to do it. That gave us a tremendous amount of leverage because during the pandemic being healthcare, our leadership within the procurement team was 100% focused on availability of supply of PPE and all the stuff that we had planned to do around contract management they no longer could support. Um, but with the tool in place, we were able to take all that activity and shift it down the chain. And now I had procurement operations resources, you know, actually doing the what's available, you know, what needs to be renewed, what's the status, what's our data quality. My team in Proc Ops was able to actually do all this activity because we had, they now have this structure, which was, you know, a, a big unanticipated benefit that we were going to need during the pandemic. Really interesting. Really interesting. Okay. We'll go ahead and go to the next slide. So in terms of operationalizing this, I mean, we, we have our goals and we, as an organization felt good at the beginning of the year, because our, our launch date with, with the tool, our launch date with Scout was actually January 1st. And so as we got into it, the one thing that we found was there were a lot more contracts that we even knew about. So managing our data became you know, a very big early focus this year. That was not necessarily intended. 
we did most of our contract abstract and prep to load into this tool in the fall. And we thought we had, you know, for the most part, we've gotten all of our contracts in. What we found as soon as we turned the tool on and we actually started using it and sharing it and inviting more people to use the tool was that we inadvertently contracts had been stored in different repositories that we were not necessarily aware of. So we created this routine, which, and again, this is something that I was able to push down through my organization, different repositories were starting to be reviewed by my team members and those contracts were being imported into, into our tool, into Scout. And so not only did the number of contracts grow, the accuracy of the data, we got to now see across all of our contracts, you know, what was the data, what were the terms? So there were some things that we know we need to fix in our contract template. There's also some things that just in the data itself that we we saw that needed to be fixed. And then also maintenance and maintenance routines were gonna be very important. So that, that first one there, the routines around managing your data and structure, you know, we did that for the first part of the year on a daily basis. Uh, we had a couple of resources that were reviewing contracts that were looking through running reports, looking for anomalies uh, and going back and correcting data. And that's that's going to be something that's going to continue for us um, in the long term, just because we want to make sure the data accuracy is there. So that's super important. The the second piece that developed the weekly contract management routine, that is something that we did on a leadership team always, which was, hey, what's the big contract? that needs to be renewed or negotiated, and when we track that. Well, it's no longer just the high visibility ones, it's now a comprehensive list. So we have someone on my proc ops team who runs a, a weekly report on Monday, and we've got flags in the tool that tell us when contracts should be reviewed by procurement. And those dates are well in advance of any sort of renewal notice. Some of those dates are six months, nine months out from a renewal because that's how long we anticipate it would take us to renegotiate and transition to a new supplier if that was necessary. Um, but those dates are all specific to the contract. So as we loaded contracts, we created a procurement flag. You know, this is a procurement needs to review flag. And, and then now on a weekly basis, I have someone that pulls a report that says, all right, what are all the contracts this week that need review? And then that person then coordinates with the business, coordinates with the category director to say, is there action that's needed? Um, and if there is, then we track it until that activity is completed. So that weekly piece there is, is now part of our DNA in terms of what we do day in and day out. Managing, monitoring and managing contracts and giving people advance notice so we can be successful. And then the fact that I can have that done during the pandemic and that routine continues to run in the background that that was key to us and then the last one is our kind of our longer term strategic piece you know because we are looking at things on a much longer horizon than we did before we're able to be proactive and so you know we're scheduling deep dives with suppliers we're, we're looking for new opportunities and we can do that because we can run the analytics on the tool, we can run the analytics on our contract database to see you know, where is our opportunity or who needs to have a review, who, when was the last time we had a review with that supplier. And, and so those things were able to stay on top of a lot, lot easier. Um, but that's something that, again, we've got resources on my procurement operations team that are supporting and driving that and then helping my category director know where to focus his time. And so that, those routines have just become part of our proc ops um, normal course of business, which has been fantastic. Um, in all honesty, those have run with very little oversight for myself as I've been focused on pandemic focused activities. And so, you know, my team has taken these and run with them, uh, which they would not have been able to do before. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Right, so we now have our second poll question, uh, and the poll is as follows. What is your most strategic driver for contract management going forward? Um, and now, uh, is it uh, data analytics and business intelligence? Is it driving incremental cost savings, managing risk, supply chain transparency, or simplifying 
digitizing processes. Um, the challenge I hit, had here was to select just one, but uh, it is your most strategic driver. So if you could, could keep that in mind. So looking forward, what's, uh, what's your most pressing thing that you need to address? Um, let's leave the, the poll open for just a, a couple more seconds. Um, we have some questions coming in, but but may I just take this opportunity to to remind you that if you'd like to ask questions of our panelists today, please do use the questions tab. Simply type in your question, and we'll be able to address it when we get to our question session. Um, so, okay, let's Mark. Let's close the poll and let's take a look at the results. Right. Um, Interesting. Yeah, I was, I was, um, I was expecting a certainly a focus in analytics and in cost savings. Um, but interesting to Brian's comment about the 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 importance of risk and risk moving to the top of the agenda, risk obligations tracking, jeopardy management, responding to the consequences of of, of uh, issues, whether they're obligations or not. Um, is obviously a key component. So interesting that that's reflected there. So yeah, I mean, Paul, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, Paul, on the, the risk piece, I, I wonder if we were to run, rerun this poll six months from now, how sticky the, the risk issue is. I mean, I think the pandemic has definitely forced that to the top. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, in the long term, how much risk remains on the top of the priority list. I would say for, for myself, as I look at the results, the data analytics piece, you know, becomes an enabler to a lot of different things. So for myself, I would have rated the data analytics, you know, probably as my top priority, just because I view it as an enabler to a lot of strategic activity. Right. Are you, are you guys surprised that supply chain is so, so low on the list? Given, given actually, yes, I am really. Given, given the, the the issues that we've seen and the consequence of our research, which says folks are really focused on on re reviewing distant sourcing and bringing it closer, or or insourcing things that are currently outsourced. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of energy and focus. Thirty four percent, if I remember the stat right, of of respondents to our last survey were really thinking about insourcing things. So I can give you guys a very recent, and this is within the last couple of weeks, and it's related to the pandemic on the supply chain transparency. And it's, it's a much broader issue than just contracts. But if, if folks have paid attention to what the CDC and the federal government have been recommending in terms of protective gear, that the, the guidelines have changed throughout the pandemic. At the very beginning of the pandemic, there was this issue of no one had enough inventory. And so guidelines were set and, and guidelines were a little bit more lax at the very beginning. And then as we've seen time go on and supply chains start to replenish, the guidelines have gotten a little more restrictive. And so what that's done though, is it's put some manufacturers into play and then it's taken those manufacturers out of play. So depending on when during the pandemic you're looking that manufacturer may or may not be approved for providing a uh, piece of equipment so if you don't have transparency to the actual SKU number of that equipment and where you got it from and who manufactured it you actually don't know if that's an approved piece of equipment at this point in time so supply chain transparency can be super important during the pandemic but it's, it's also, it's, it's much beyond just contract management, it's inventory management. Mm, interesting yeah, I also wonder, okay. yeah, I also wonder that, you know, maybe it's a competition with all the other uh, good options that are on this page, right? So, it's, you know, if you don't have a, a simplified digitized process, or if you don't have that business intelligence, you might not be worrying about supply chain just quite yet. Yeah, that's also true. Okay, John, I think we should, I think we should move on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that was very interesting. I mean, that's a great segue into uh, talking about the Scout product a little bit. Um, uh, great drivers, and hopefully, like a lot of our customers are seeing those drivers kind of play out uh, using Scout as well. Um, so, as I was saying before, you know, we really uh, came up with the contract module by talking to our customers and understanding how they think about their problems and how they want to handle certain things. So, 
um, we came up with these design principles, and these are principles that you'll see kind of throughout the Scout product, not just in not just in contracts, right? So um, efficiency, savings, and this is to what Brian was talking about uh, earlier, just about justifying the the spend uh, in new technology, visibility, uh, and adoption. Um, so efficiency really is all about just being flexible and being able to adapt to new circumstances. Um, we also have a lot of collabor collaborative tools within our product to help teams kind of get together uh, and, and share information. Um, savings is pretty self-explanatory, -ex hopefully, and, and, and that is that you're actually getting a return for the investment in our product, right? So you're actually seeing, um, uh, seeing contracts kind of pop up more, that you don't let them uh, expire more, there's no penalties. Uh, you understand what the saving goals are. Um, visibility, having a clear view, um, this really relates to transparency in our in our world, um, where you know instead of having critical documents or information within someone's laptop or someone's drive, um, that uh, that you really let the right information come to the right people. Um, and then lastly, adoption. Um, easy to use is a huge part of how we design Scout. Um, we really do believe that you know if you don't have a lot of your organization that need to use the tool using the tool, um, you inevitably have those kind of silos out there where um, visibility and all the other stuff uh, really isn't as possible. Um, so uh, go, you can go to the next slide here and I'll talk a little more specifically about how these principles kind of come to just our contract module. Um, so we have built in um, and everything here is, is really geared towards having something that's simple um, and uh, and able to track and manage uh, our customers' obligations, right? So being able to streamline communications, and that's within your own team, um, or even with the suppliers um, on our supply portal. Um, having a, a construct for contracts and hierarchy uh, that's easy to set up and easy to understand, um, and supporting a lot of the workflows um, that may be specific to your organization. So um, a lot of these things are super configurable. Uh, depending on how uh, how your organizations are set up. So we've certainly noticed that um, everyone is a little bit different. Everyone manages contracts a little bit differently. Um, I mean, the automation part uh, is is uh, front and center for sure in just being able to proactively manage your contracts or renewals, um, making sure that you're notified when something comes up and needs your attention. Um, and that could be uh, because of milestones delayed or because you know, a contract is really uh, about to expire, really needs renewal. Um, and overall, you know, our aim is to is to increase the impact of a sourcing team, right? So, and, and I'll and I'll kind of generalize that and, and say that it's sourcing and contracting teams, depending on how your org is structured, um, to the whole business. So there's a lot of things that, uh, um, you know, when we talk to our customers, that they uh, they can improve and try to fill some of these gaps um, and and be more productive. Um, and so that that is certainly our goal with our with our product here. So the next slide, um, there is a little video uh, that we'll show that gives you a little bit uh, of a demo. Um, this is our contract we call Workbench. Um, so within the Workbench, you have all sorts of contracts and varying statuses, things that need attention, things that need approval, um, things that are, might be soon to expire. Um, and every single one of these contracts is not just the document itself, but also just the entire process is around it. Um, and on this workbench, you can filter for certain things and manage it how you want and save certain views. Um, you can do this by who's assigned to it and um, who's responsible for these things or by anything else that you want. Um, within each contract, there's sort of the, uh, the metadata, if you will, all of the, um, the uh, parameters that go into a contract, but also a lot of the processes that are involved in getting a contract approved and signed within your own org, right? So, so very easily you can add in milestones like uh, the video is doing here and set a date and set an assignee um, and uh, and certainly you can do a lot of other things with attachments um, dragging and dropping documents in here um, a lot of this is very customizable as well uh, you can um, you see on the left side a lot of different tabs and categories and a lot of those um, can be made up by you depending on what your processes are um, you can certainly relate things and see relationship trees within the contracts as well let this run a little longer um so uh, here's the approval tab but obviously there's supplier information that you can drag in we have a supplier portal as well um and right now this uh, demo is sending the contract itself through an approval process and 
uh, it will generate essentially an approval tree based on, uh, I think in, the, in this example, it was dollar amount, but it could be by category, by anything else. Um, and, uh, and the user can very easily approve it or, or reject it, depending on how it is. And in terms of communication, uh, the team chat is a function that a lot of our folks love. Um, you can very easily talk to the team that's responsible for this contract. And, uh, and there's usually there's a lot of, uh, a lot of text in there. In my example, it's just a, uh, just a one liner, but, but it really helps teams get together and talk about what they need to do to get a contract across the, across the line. Great. Thank you. Um, the next couple are just, to, just screenshots in case their video doesn't work out here. It's always good to be prepared. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Just in case. You never know with technology, right? Exactly. Um, all right. So the last thing I have here, I'll talk a little bit about just the, the big news for Scout, at least. Um, it should impact um, our customers in the short term. But Workday um, requires Scout earlier this year. Um, and the vision there is really to have a full end-to-end um, you know, source to pay type of um, workflow, right? So right now, as you may know, if you're a Scout customer or if you are familiar with our tools, that we do a lot of things within the sourcing side, the supplier performance side, contract management, like we've been talking about today. Um, and Workday also has a contract management side as well. It's a little bit different than ours, um, but it very, uh, it very nicely fits in uh, with the things that we're doing. Um, and so we're working on connectors between the two products. Um, so that our customers can utilize all of the workday functions in their financial tools, um, their HCM tools, um, around purchasing, um, tracking of contracts in a spend sense, right? And then, then having a lot of that uh, transactional part that uh, the Scout currently does not have. Um, and so this is going to be a great solution all put together uh, and hopefully brings a lot of value to our customers um, where they don't have to jump back and forth between different products and, and kind of worry about the integration piece. Um, so I think to you know, sum it all up, I think um, it, it's it, a lot of the Scout um, prerogative is, is just to continue to bring a value to our customer and users, right? The Workday piece is, is one part, but we continue to add uh, various uh, functionalities, um, particularly seeing how you know, the drivers that you guys have mentioned today and try to build a lot of those things into our product. I, I can't claim to be perfect on all those things right now. Um, so we also saw the value that Brian kind of brought up about features like automation and facilitating communications within the team and just tracking and storing, managing contracts with a tool that's easily to use and just easily adoptable. Um, that brings a lot of value, hopefully, um, to everyone's work, but, but as we heard today, to Brian's work, work for sure. And, and you know, we didn't design any of this to, to sort of predict for a pandemic or anything like that, but it's good to hear that all those things that we think is valuable uh, and make your process more robust is uh, is still working out, right? And, and it probably is particularly valuable in the, in these crazy times. Um, so, Brian, I want to thank you for uh, sharing your experience. I think it's it's certainly valuable for me and hopefully uh, to others as well. Mm, absolutely. So, um, I, I think let's let's move on to onto questions. We have we have a number of questions coming in. Um, and then, guys, there'll almost certainly be there'll be an opportunity to to sum up at the end. So, uh, so questions for you though, Brian. Um, around your implementation, how long did it take you to to implement your your solution? Yeah, I can definitely go over that. So, we actually uh, signed the contract late August, early September. Um, we would plan to in order to kick off what I would consider to be our design of our implementation, which is really around our configuration of the implementation. We started that at the end of October. So really it took us in terms of what our configuration needed to be from the end of October until the end of December. So around two months. Um, a large part of that time is more downtime that we were looking at our own data, abstracting data that we wanted to put into the system. Um, in order to get it ready to go for a January 1st launch. What I will say I learned from that process though is uh, if I had to do it all over again, I would launch the solution much faster because what I found is the data entry into the solution itself is, is much easier in the solution than it is to try to abstract contracts um, into some sort of other Excel sheet and then to upload it. 
just because it's so much more native in the solution to key in the data. Um, so my, my advice would be you can configure um, and stand the solution up in you know a matter of days. And I, I would do that first, uh, and then I would work on the data entry can piece. So I did most of my what I thought was most of my abstract prior to launch. Uh, I would flip that. I would configure it. I would launch it. I would start to use it. I would have the abstract happen after that. Um, because what we also found was it's so easy in Scout to add a data field, to change data fields, to you know make configuration changes. We changed a ton after we went live, and it was we just you know on a daily basis we were we were adjusting to make it work better for our business, and it was easy to do. Mm, interesting. Um, and, and for you, for you, John, um, do all the stakeholders uh, need licenses for your product to view simply data that within the tool, like the status of their contracts? So, so no. Um, so there are uh, a lot of stakeholders within our system that are that do not require a license. Um, so uh, there's certain functionalities that's that's not you know open to just any stakeholder, but in terms of if you're a business and you want to do a request right into a project or a contract um, and you want to kind of continue to track that contract, uh, those folks uh, do not need a license. Very good. I, I will say that just to add on to that, that was a huge benefit for us. So I've got a relatively small procurement team that has the full access, um, but then I've got legal, IT, functional people that all have you know, effectively, it's not just a read only because they can make edits and add content, um, but they don't have full access. And, and those those licenses you know, are, are charged for. That's that's yeah. fantastic because I, I have the ability to show anybody in the organization who needs access, which is awesome. Uh, so so this is not rehearsed, so you can shoot me afterwards. Um, but <laughs> one, one of the um, one of the, the my observations, having gone through this the, the automation loop several times in previous employers, um, is the amount of energy that that's required around integration into other systems within your system stack. So Brian, did you have that issue to 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 to, to deal with, or is this a standalone CLM tool? Uh, there was a decision we had to make early on, uh, and you know, I kind of laid a little bit of the background that we're a new organization. We were standing up a lot, so every function was going through that same process. Our our IT team was completely invested in you know other critical systems, so they were not available. That was one of the key drivers to going with a solution like Scout was procurement on its own could set this up it was web-based didn't require me to get the IT team involved um, I didn't integrate with anything else which also allowed me to do this now as opposed to have to wait and be put on the IT schedule very good do, do you have any plans to do uh, any integrations later on down the pike or not uh, we don't and actually I don't know that it's necessary for us you know given that we've we have several hundred suppliers um you know each of those has their own contracts uh, but because we take things from an idea for savings through all of our sourcing activities and the solution to the contract itself um and then we write our po's in a separate system and, and so that's a, sort of a natural break so we don't have any plans to fully to integrate it further in the in the future we did we did set up okta from just a login perspective, but that was a super simple interface, and it was it was super helpful to do also. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, if if you can avoid that level of integration, it's certainly incredibly expensive and time consuming to get that piece right. Which was I was intrigued um, how you did a because a, a, a turn up of of a couple of months, and to your point, maybe even a couple of days is quite phenomenal. Uh, with that yeah. number, with that number of suppliers, so that's uh, that's very interesting indeed. Um, so we've got a um, so I think I think we covered Austin's question. Um, what is the integration like with your ERP system? Um, basically, th there isn't one. I think that's that's the that's the summary. That's correct. We write our POs in our ERP system. We put our contracts into Scout. The two aren't integrated. Right, gotcha, 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 gotcha. So, 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 John, do, do you is that is that a typical 
um, implementation with your clients, or do you see folks who muted that integration? We, we do see clients that do the integration, but that is typical of our clients, right? Because I think one of the things that is great about Scout is that it, it, you can come online very, very quickly. So um, and in terms of in, in folks like Brian, their functions, um, Scout kind of already supports everything that they do we need to do. There are other things that they can do in other systems that don't require integration. That's one of the keys to, to get it up and running and going pretty quickly. But we obviously do have um, APIs available for that integration if, uh, if folks do kind of yeah, decide to go. Question, question of speed and cost, right? Yeah, yeah no, exactly. absolutely. And, and like you said, Paul, like I think it adds certainly a lot more time. Um, you, you, you generally need some either your IT department to be involved or a consultant or something like that that wants to uh, design a system rather than just use one particular tool. Great. Can I add something to that though, Paul? Sure, go ahead. The, you know, while I don't have the system connected to our ERP, uh, what I do have in Scout though is I have my supplier list that I manage contracts for, all of my contracts, all of my sourcing activity is in there already. Uh, along with my you know, negotiations and pricing. So it also allows me to put projects in there. So my projects, whether they are strategic projects that are driving savings or they're tactical projects that we have done quick negotiation on, my whole project pipeline is in there. So I have you know, the ability to export and create dashboards out of Scout for my projects, my pipeline, my savings, and the contracts that I have related to them. So, I have quite a bit of integration because all that stuff is native in Scout. So all that stuff is together. Mm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. With an eye to the time, guys, um, I think if, if I could hand back first to Brian and then to John for some uh, some final comments. Yeah. So final comments um, from me is just looking at how long it took us. We put a lot of thought into it. I think we don't know. We didn't know. We didn't know. Tools like Scout are so flexible, stand it up faster, focus on all of the inputting of data uh, after you set it up and people really get to get into the tool because you will change stuff, you'll learn stuff, and it's just a much faster process once you have it in there. That, that's, my big, that's my big takeaway. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and John? Yeah, so I mean, it's it, so this has been great. It's great to kind of work with Brian on doing implementation and seeing the impact that we're making in their organization, right? So, um, and same with all of our other customers as well. Um, and we continue to kind of develop additional features to make things easier to use, have more functionality, but not increase complexity. Um, so those are our goals for sure. I mean, so I think going forward, we'll continue to work on that. Great. Okay, well, gentlemen, um, uh, thank you. Thank you both for a really interesting uh, and insightful presentation today. Um, so best practices from Brian, I heard routine is key. Uh, so that certainly resonated with me. And uh, it's really interesting to see how, how technology can really support the, um, the, the, the business case and the, and the business requirements and how Scout RFP fills that spot. So to John and to Brian, thank you both very much indeed. And to our audience today, thank you for thank you for listening and thank you for all the great questions. And I hope you found this uh, this session today useful. So uh, with that, let's draw this one to a close. So thank you very much. Thanks for your attention and goodbye. Thank you, guys.